this session. Alhamdulillah, uh, the idea of our Triple IT uh, on classes started when we are facing this pandemic, uh, COVID-19. It also comes with blessing uh, uh, and uh, have a classes inviting prominent scholars uh, and have brother sister from all over the world to join us in this online platform. Uh, our main objective uh, of this uh, series of classes, uh, among, among them, uh, uh, we want uh, this material, uh, this subject matter, will be used uh, in the classroom teaching uh, by other lecturers in their classes. So our intention is to have the lecture recorded, and then we put it on, on YouTube channel, on our Facebook, and inshallah, uh, through time, uh, our lecturers and our students will uh, notice the classes and will use them uh, in their class. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, we are very thankful. We have with us uh, tonight uh, our dear professor, uh, Said Ahmad. Uh, he is our close friend uh, of the institute. He is our senior research fellow. He, he is our resource person. We invited him on all our uh, seminars, workshops. Yeah. So, uh, Prof has a very long CV. Uh, but let me highlight one or two of them uh, just for our uh, uh, discussion tonight. Prof got his uh, bachelor from University of Bangsaan, Malaysia, and master's and PhD from Victoria University of Manchester, uh, United Kingdom, in 1999. He is currently a professor uh, in Faculty of Human Ecology, uh, University of Malaysia. Uh, he's Magnum Opus is his book titled tonight, Epistle Major Ibn Khaldun, uh, published, uh, uh, published simultaneously in UK, in Canada, in 2003, 2007, and I, I think the last printing is 2010. Any new edition, bro? No, no, 2010? It was, that. It, was, it was the digital edition. 2010. Digital edition, yeah. yeah. And Pro, uh, Pro also wrote uh, other subject matters uh, regarding uh, civilization and knowledge. Uh, other than academic, uh, it worth noting that Prof is also a founder of Key Sahas, Kyoto, yeah, yeah. Kyoto International yeah, Consortium Kyoto. Yeah, for correct, Asian correct, Studies. Correct. Yeah, Kikas, right. Kikas, yeah. Yeah, Kikas, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a resource person uh, for Institute uh, the International Institute for Islamic Thought uh, on Epistemology and Renewal of Education in Asia, Epistemology and Education Reform for South Asia Region. That's what they call it. Yeah, correct. He, uh, he represents Malaysia at, uh, for UNESCO high level meetings and so on and so forth. So these are among few uh, accolades that uh, related prof. Regarding our uh, topic tonight, uh, let me read uh, just two, two or three lines uh, on Ibn Khaldun. This is the introduction from Prof. Book. Ibn Khaldun was an extraordinary scholar, perhaps one of the most read and written about Muslim intellectual. His revolutionary views on several issues that appear, especially in his magnum opus, the Muqaddima, had attracted the attention of Muslim scholars and many Western, Western thinkers from various academic fields background. I think that's just a brief introduction. So Prof will, uh, will, will talk with us in, in this seven series on many facets, many aspects of it. So without further ado, we invite our dear Professor uh, Said Ahmad. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Shahran, for the a uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina Muhammadin. Ashraf al-anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Wa man tabi'ahu wa nasarahu ila yawmiddin. Rabbishrahli sadri wa yassirli amri 
wahlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim uh thank you very much for the you know uh, opportunity that's given to me you know to be in one of the uh, lecture series organized by triple it inshallah tonight uh, i'll be sharing with you uh something on ibn khaldun um well of course as uh, was mentioned by brother shahran ibn khaldun was a, a, an extraordinary thinker and uh, most people knows him by name huh? of course uh, he wrote uh, so many treatises and books and uh, you know and was very much uh, read and uh, written um and as a scholar he actually is quite difficult to classify ibn khaldun you know who is ibn khaldun i probably would um read some of the uh, you know words uh, by uh, oliver leman yeah, who wrote a forward for my books yeah. he said ibn khaldun is a thinker is is very difficult to classify he is he is known today as a social, social thinker and also there is no doubt that i mean his writing on politics and the sorts of rules which we should employ when analyzing the state so he was also claimed to be you know recognized to be uh, the father of political science some people say he he was he is a father of sociology and things like that yeah uh what we notice when we examine his political thought and his carry capacity to balance his theoretical construction with his practical observation on everyday life and of course uh, what we are um, uh, trying to um, uh, dwell tonight is um, to read his uh, <clears throat> Magnum Opus, the Mukaddimah, part of the Mukaddimah actually. It's not all the Mukaddimah, because uh, as as we know that uh, <clears throat> as a as a scholar who, who has been studied uh, by so many people from um, so many disciplines, he well, if I would. Uh, you know refer to aziz al azmi aziz al azmi was one of the scholars who studied ibn khaldun very early in uh, 1986 he published a book he published a book entitled ibn khaldun in modern scholarship and in that book he already collected more than 800 books on ibn khaldun so it was nearly 40 years ago and now i think it would be double yeah. the, the i mean the, the the books written on him yeah, in the form of books or articles or journals or what not and of course i cannot claim that i'm expert on ibn khaldun because i am a student of ibn khaldun we we all of us are studying ibn khaldun yeah. we might know something about ibn khaldun but But there are so many other things about Ibn Khaldun that we we don't know. It's beyond our knowledge. It is like you know um, someone is fishing in the sea. <laughs> we can catch only a few fish, and there are so many other fish in the sea that we don't know and we cannot catch and we don't recognize. So that's I, I mean that that's the analogy. So uh, maybe that's that's very good analogy. You know, for 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 us to start tonight. You know, so. If there are some question that I cannot respond, that then you know that that fish I I, I don't catch that fish. <laughs> this is uh, this is the nature of what this is. Well, of course, I think if you if you try to read everything, 
that has been written about Ibn Khaldun. Well, you will, uh, I mean, you would die before you finish all this, you know, <laughs> you could finish the job, you know. <laughs> so, well, never mind, it's inshallah, for, 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 for this series of lectures, we, we fo focus only part of the, the Muqaddimah, yeah? the, 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 you know, uh, the big book Muqaddimah. Well, uh, what is Muqaddimah eh? to begin with? Uh, of course, uh, he was known, uh, I mean, um, uh, synonymous you know, with uh, Muqaddimah. When we speak about Ibn Khaldun, we, we talk about Muqaddimah. Yeah? Actually, Muqaddimah is he, an introduction for the, you know, the... Um, the big historical work by Ibn Khaldun. And then the title of the book is very long, actually. Uh, he put the title, Kitab Al-Ibar. Muqaddimah, Muqaddimah, Li Kitab Al-Ibar. Wa diwan al-mubtada wal-khabar. Fi ayyam al-Arab wal-ajam wal-barbar. Wa man asarahum min zawi sultan al-akbar. I think it's a very long title. No? Never mind. We we just refer Mukadima, yeah, because we are we are talking about Mukadima. Now, what we have in the Mukadima? Mukadima is the you know actually is the uh, prolegomena. Yeah? It's a lengthy theoretical consideration of the law of history, as well as a general survey of Islamic societies and in and their arts and science. And Muqaddimah is divided into six chapters. Chapter one, chapter one, deal with human society in general. Chapter two, it was about nomadic society. Chapter three, he was talking about the system, states, caliph, kings. And chapter four, he was talking about a civilized society and the construction or the formation of towns and cities and so on. And chapter six, yeah, chapter five, he was talking about trade and ways of earning livelihood. He was talking about society. Yeah? Uh, and uh, chapter six about knowledge, science, elm. So what we are doing in this series of lectures, we are only focusing on chapter six. One of the six chapters. Yeah? Well, why chapter six? Chapter six is actually, if you are familiar with Ibn Khaldun, actually chapter six occupy almost one third of the Muqaddimah. It's the biggest chapter. It, it occupy, uh, I mean, it occupy almost one third of the Muqaddimah. So, in chapter six, he talks about knowledge, about system, about classification, of knowledge, about everything about knowledge. Uh, well, that's that's what we are we are we are trying to study. You know, it's, it's happened that um, I spent almost. Uh, I think when I studied this book, you know, I spent almost six months to read the. Arabic as well as uh, the uh, translation, uh, but it was a long time ago. It was in 2000, no, 1995, you know, long time ago. Sometimes, you know, I, I at least forgot some of the things that I read. You know, I spent um, almost six months to read the whole of Ibn Khaldun and to study chapter six. And that was part of my PhD project at that time. And it was turned into a book, 
a book titled The Epistemology of Ibn Khaldun. So this lecture will be based on will be based on my book. Yeah? That book was was uh, as uh, uh, Brother Shahran mentioned just now was uh, published first time in 2003 and uh, republished in two times and, and now it's available in digital form, I think. Yeah? Uh, inshallah. So now uh, <laughs> we go to the introductory materials to study to the study of chapter six of the Muqaddimah. Yeah? Uh, well, what is the subject matter of chapter six? The real subject, subject matter of chapter six is actually about teaching. Teaching is a craft. Fi anna ta'lim al-ilm min jumlati sana'i. He, I mean, he, he categorized teaching as one of the craft. Uh, produced within human 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 society and of course uh, this that that's the title of the of the of the section prior to this there are some other introductory remarks by ibn khaldun and uh, our intertextual studies shows that there are two distinct versions of the introduction to chapter six. So there are varieties of uh, version eh? because as you know that Muqaddimah was, uh, was, uh, was uh, written and copied many times. So there are some, some uh, kind of varieties of uh, um, versions eh? of the Muqaddimah. So the two distinct version eh, uh, of the introduction to chapter six. One of these is a single short passage entitled "Knowledge and Teaching Are Natural in Human Culture." Fi anna al-ilm wa ta'lim tabi'iyun fil umran al-bashari. Something that is natural. We are passing knowledge from one generation to another generation. The other consists of an introduction followed by a uh, six session in which the author speaks about various general and particular issues of epistemology. And Franz, Rosent or, uh, Franz Rosenthal, who translated um, Muqaddimah, notes that the occurrence of these two versions in, in, in the introduction of uh, his translation of the Muqaddimah, the specific content of each of the two versions uh, will be discussed later, you know, when, when, we, uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the uh, variety of the text. Um, well, that is about the, the manuscript. What about the editions? Because we have... Uh, with us, no, uh, many editions of Ibn Khaldun, uh, particularly in Arabic, and it was translated into so many other, uh, so many languages other than Arabic. Um, <clears throat> right. Rosenthal informs us that, well, because Rosenthal, uh, the one who translated into English, he studied all the, all the manuscript, actually. He compared all the manuscript before he uh, undertake the, the translations. Uh, he said Muqaddimah was a very well-documented book. And this means that the original manuscript of the book have been very well preserved. What we have in front of us and what we read now from the from the Arabic text was, was a very well-documented uh, uh, book. Of course, the, 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 the manuscripts are numerous. 
in Turkey alone, there are four manuscripts that were written during the time of Muhammadun, during his lifetime, no? at least four manuscripts. Another two undated manuscripts were believed to have been written <coughs> shortly after his death. And for that one, according to Rosenthal, I still uh, you know, we, we um, uh, refer to uh, Rosenthal, all the manuscripts are very, very high in quality, so well preserved. And he described the three copies of the manuscripts, A, B, and C. Uh, as having the same standard textual values, eh? although it was uh, handwritten, but it was uh, you know um, very high standard, uh, well written. Eh? Although Rosenthal does not deny the possibility of probably occasional mistake, but he is confident. He is very confident that. A careful written manuscript is almost comparable to printed text. At that time, of course, uh, we don't have the photocopy machine. <laughs> we, we, we don't have camera. We don't have anything. And all are written you know, by, by hand. You know? They are copying. Yeah? But it was a very, very carefully you know, um, monitored the copy, and it was, well, as Rosenthal said, it was comparable to a printed text. Thus, the manuscripts of this kind can properly be considered as authentic copies of the text. Therefore, any factual mistakes or miswriting <coughs> uh, may well be considered for this purpose as the author's own work. But what about the, the you know the, the 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 varieties of the of the version eh? because we we understand that the this uh, the text uh, were copied so many times you know by um, scholars who come after Ibn Khaldun and trying to copy you know of course, uh, in 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 most cases, you know, when when we use the text for teaching, you know, some some scholars they use the text for teaching, you know, they, it is their habit to put the, in something like, like something like probably uh, notes in the text, eh? a dawabit, eh? eh? We put some notes, eh? and uh, when someone copy the text, you know, the notes outside the, the text sometimes will be will bro brought into, will be brought into the text, so that the, 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 the version will be longer. And if we compare the, 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 the manuscript, then we'll find it, I mean, uh, some kind of uh, uh, varieties in terms of, you know, um, textual, uh, textual varieties. So that's never mind, because uh, it is uh, additional notes by the the you know the scholars who use the text for for their teaching. Now the question is: If the manuscripts are evidently well preserved and have undergone uh, a careful process of copying, which in some cases was done under a very close personal supervision of the author himself. Why do there exist a great number of considerable variations between the text? And in the case of the Muqaddimah, the variant reading are variant not merely in the ordinary sense. They involve a considerable extent version of the text. And in some cases of the introductory remark to chapter six, so, in some cases, they are, you know, the uh, the additional section, small section, in the text. Uh, 
so I quote from Rosenthal. Eh? What, what Rosenthal uh, said about it. They are addition and correction made by Ibn Khaldun at different period of his life. By Ibn Khaldun himself. Eh? He also made corrections. Or he also made notes. Eh? Um, in in his own uh, in his own text, so that is uh, text, and when is uh, you know is finished, you know, sometimes that the text is is uh, uh, given to the someone as a present, so that text will remain as 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 it is. Yeah? Um, the existence of such sensitive emendation. Demonstrate in a in, in a fascinating manner that the medieval author work much of his own, uh, much as his modern colleague does. And from this, we may come to the simple logical conclusions that the textual variations in the case uh, in this case, uh, no doubt, the work. Of the author himself. That means that is the work by, by Ibn Khaldun himself. It is understandable that the author would make amendments, corrections, and additions uh, where he might think necessary as he goes through the text several times. So it's correction made by the author himself. So therefore, we have there uh, in front of us, uh, in front of us, uh, so many editions of uh, Muqaddimah. But Rosenthal used the longest version of the Muqaddimah. So that's it because uh, uh, he said that is the most complete uh, version. Well, the publication of a small portion of the Muqaddimah started as early as before 1857, uh, when, when uh, no people start you know, doing the printing. And it was associated with Hammer Puckstall and Sylvester de Sassi. It was uh, during the years of 1857 and 1858 that the two basic complete editions of the Muqaddimah came to reality. 1858. So more than 100 years ago. Eh? The Egy Egyptian edition also known as the Bulak edition, edited by uh, uh, a person by the name of Abu Nasr al hurini printed in Bulak, was published in 1857 also, yeah? while the first complete scholarly European edition of the Muqaddimah was published by uh, Etienne Marc Pertemier in Paris in 1858. It was around that, that year, you know, uh, the appearance of the European version of the Muqaddimah. For the modern scholarly study of the Muqaddimah, these two texts are considered by many as the most authentic and uh, considerably reliable text. While the Hurini text was in fact intended at this, uh, uh, as the first volume of the complete edition of Kitab Alibar. Kitab Alibar is, you know, the, uh, is about uh, six or seven uh, volumes. Yeah? <clears throat> While preparing this edition, Horini apparently used two manuscripts of the Muqaddimah, which he called the Fes manuscript and the Tunis manuscript. It's available in Fes and available in, in Tunis. The Tunis manuscript was Ibn Khaldun's original dedication to the Hafsid ruler. The, the, the book he presented to Hafsid ruler while the first manuscript was Ibn Khaldun's donation copy, also from Ibn Khaldun. He donated the, 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 the copy of Muqaddimah. 
While editing the text, Horimi often made corrections according to his own judgment. This text has, has uh, some importance of its own by virtue of the fact that it provides the earliest text of the Muqaddimah available in printed form. So it was around 1850s no, that the printed form of the Muqaddimah uh, were available. Katrimiya edition of the Muqaddimah was published in Paris in 1858, a year after the appearance of the Bulak edition. It was uh, published by the Academy des Inscriptions at Belles Lettres, and it was printed by uh, Fermin Didot Ferres and presently available in three volumes. That was the only, uh, th this is the only, you know, um, the, 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 the separated into three volumes. Huh? Uh, we always have uh, the, uh, the, the Inu Mukaddima is in one volume. Yeah? And this version is in three volumes. Unfortunately, this edition was published with, was published without introduction, and thus without official information from the hand of the editor about manuscript he used. Nobody knows, and he did not mention. Based on this lane, the French translator of the Muqaddimah, yeah? uh, the English translator, uh, translator was uh, uh, Rosenthal. And this is French translation, uh, this lane. Cartemier based his edition on four manuscripts. He said he used four manuscripts, which is manuscript A, B, and C. And that manuscript dated 1146. In the Bibliothèque Nationale while manuscript B is in Munich. Manuscript C is a copy made in 1835 by Damat Ibrahim. And that then the manuscript, and it is now in the Bibliotheque Nationale. While manuscript D is the oldest among the four used by the Katamir, is also the Arabic manuscript of the Bibliothèque Nationale. And if you see that all these manuscripts are found around Europe, yeah? it's not in, not, not in, in uh, uh, North Africa, it is in the, uh, the, the, the manuscript uh, were preserved in European uh, countries. Other than the above two editions, there are editions which were published in Beirut and Egypt, another version uh, in uh, Beirut and Egypt, However, as uh, Professor uh, Aziz Alazma notes, eh, most of those editions are pirated version of the Horini. So it is actually a, a copy from the Horini version eh, uh, or Horini text, and therefore carry no superiority in terms of textual values. Eh. It is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he called it a pirated copy. Uh, well, for the purpose of the present study, yeah, our, our, our uh, you know, uh, discussions, uh, we mainly use uh, the, I mean, the textual reference will be for, um, uh, to the Cartemir edition, while uh, we use uh, Rosenthal translation. Yeah? Uh, in English, yeah? is the only complete English translation available so far. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> as an introduction for the Muqaddimah, yeah? this book or the, the Muqaddimah play a very important role in providing conceptual and paradigmatic framework, as well as epistemological foundation uh, of the study of human society and civilization. 
it is on this basis of uh of it is on the basis of this framework that the author established his new science of umran so we will discuss about umran later on in we actually have uh, we will have a uh, uh, seven lecture series you know inshallah we we'll try to pick up you know, uh, some of the important issues that we think important to discuss here um he established here you no know, his new science of umran the study of the history culture and civilization of human society um <clears throat> Uh, very much on the on this book, the Muqaddimah, particularly uh, in chapter six, which deals with epistemology, the sociology of knowledge and craft, and the classification of science. It will be uh, good no, not not to dwell too much on the preliminary. discussion here because right <clears throat> what uh, i mean the, the the next point that that, that I, I would like to highlight um how may, how may, um how much time that we we have we still have a uh, brother sharan uh, we still have another 20 minutes now uh, for you. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next important thing that uh, I'm trying to highlight here is is about the you know the the nature of uh, discussion uh, in the book orthodoxy versus philosophy. Uh, because some people say that Ibn Khaldun was an orthodox. And some claim that Ibn Khaldun was a philosopher. So this is orthodoxy versus philosophy. Well, the tension between religious orthodoxy and philosophy is actually is an age-old problem in Islam. Within Islamic intellectual circles, we found that this, you know, the uh, the conflict between orthodoxy and philosophy um, <clears throat> since the, the the early days of Islam. It begins as early as the first penetration of the Greeks into Arabic, when the Greek comes into Arabic uh, or Islamic world through the process of translation, and later become one of the uh, one of the most topical subjects of discussion. In, in Arabic, they call it uh, falsafa, yeah? philosophy. Although the tension had already occurred earlier with the arrival of Greek text translation, the actual literary battle between religious and philosophical scholars took place only after the publication of Al-Ghazali Tahaftul Falasifa. And you know, during that, the before Al Ghazali, there was a lot of translations of uh, Greek uh, philosophy into Arabic, yeah? and we have um, many um, Muslim philosophers such as Al Farabi, Ibn Sina, Al Kindi, and so on. Yeah? Al Farabi was considered as the second teacher of the Aristotles. Yeah? And he he is very you know very well versed in Greek philosophy. Then he wrote he wrote uh, philosophy in Arabic. Uh, he I think I don't know as far as I know no, he he never uh, write in 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 Greek, although he knows uh, Greek language. 
And uh, yeah, after the publication of Al Ghazali's Tahaftul Falasifah, this is based on the assumptions that Tahaput Al Ghazali was the first book written for this special purpose of rejecting or refuting philosophy. And prior to that, Al Ghazali published Maqasid Al Falasifa, in which he explained philosophy in some details. I think we already, you know, um, attended lectures by Professor Ahmad Bakta about this, uh, you know, uh, conflict between philosophy and, you know, and Islam, you know, and, uh, uh, in Tahafut, yeah, Tahafut and uh, uh, Maqasid uh, Al Falasifa. Yeah. In the Muqaddimah, which was published some three centuries, uh, three centuries after the Tahafut, Ibn same basic problem of Islamic thought. The conflict between religious orthodoxy and philosophy in the study of man and human society. Not only that, it seems that this tension also greatly influenced his stance and argument. Right. Um, we should probably we, we, we can recall you know, the difference between the two types of approach in a way you know is uh, very fundamental eh, between orthodoxy and philosophy. Um, it is between revelation on the one hand and reason on the other. It is about reason and revelation. The Orthodox believe that the ultimate truth about men and society has to be referred to the Quran, the Wahyu. That's the only source. And the prophetic tradition. And of course, we should refer to religious law. Right? And the basic notion is uh, the primacy of revelation over reason. Put the revelation higher than the level of reason. On the other hand, from the point of view of the philosophy of philosophy, the order is reverse. The primacy of rational inquiry over revelation. They put a uh, reason uh, earlier yeah? in both the theoretical and the practical sciences. This is the point of difference between orthodoxy and philosophy. Okay, now we come back to the Muqaddimah. What the what is the the I mean what is Ibn Khaldun stands in facing these basic problems? conflict between uh, orthodoxy and philosophy, where he stands. Uh, well, I feel quite strongly that Ibn Khaldun's stance is to some extent more inclined towards orthodoxy. That is my interpretation, my reading. Yeah? Some, some, some people might not agree with me. You know? That is, uh, that is, you know, that is uh, uh, the the interpretation. Of course, we both of us, you know, uh, uh, all of us, you know, we 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 read the text, but our interpretation might be different. Yeah? This is this is my interpretation. It is more inclined to orthodoxy. My judgment is basically based upon his attempt to refute philosophy. In one of the passage in chapter six of the Muqaddimah, we will, uh, you know, we'll uh, talk about it later on. <clears throat> in one of the chapter in the Muqaddimah, 
he wrote a section entitled Refutation of Philosophy. He refuted philosophy in that particular section. And that chapter consists of his argument against philosophy. Not only that, he also seemed to be inclined toward Sufism. Hmm? Because in, in the later, uh, I mean, part of his life, you know, I think uh, we know that he is very much occupied with uh, Sufism. Yeah. Um, and this is explic explic explicitly expressed in his special discussion on Sufism in chapter 6 also. And on another occasion, he also attempt to reconcile orthodoxy with philosophy. I mean, that, that he, he might not reject everything philosophy. You know? He tried also to reconcile. The attempt can be seen in his discussion of the concept of prophecy, or nubuwa, huh? in, in Arabic. Yeah? He explained prophecy in both philosophical as well as in religious terms. Philosophical arguments and religious dogma are mixed together in order to grasp the true nature of prophecy. He's trying to explain what prophecy is all about. You know? A nubuwa. Try to convince the reader and use uh, some kind of uh, logical argument you know? to convince that there is the, the uh, I mean, uh, uh, the concept of nubuwa in Islam that we can understand. You know? In this sense, it would it would not be appropriate to consider Ibn Khaldun representing the idea of pure orthodoxy in the very strict sense of the world. So, although he's very much inclined toward Sufism, but he is, also, I mean, he's not rejecting, I mean, he's not making a total rejections uh, of philosophy. Of course, you know, I have indicated above that, that Sufism is an important element in the Mukhaddun part. To assess the strength of its influence is not too difficult if we glance through uh, the Muqaddimah. In chapter 6 of the Muqaddimah, Ibn Khaldun allocates a long passage specifically to a discussion of the science of Sufism in all aspects. He gives a detailed account on Sufism, what he understands. Beside that passage, we also find a number of times and many occasions when the author express his ideas in mystical terms. He always use mystical terms. No? And at times, he praise Sufism and even call the Muslim to practice it. He propagate Sufism, and he, I mean, they invite people to, to you know, to, uh, to practice um, Sufism uh, in their life. Yeah? One of the good example is perhaps when he speaks about the concept of. Uh, uh, he speaks about the concept and the nature of happiness, asada, in Islam. You know, you know that uh, we 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 have this concept of asada or happiness in Islam. He believed that the true happiness can only be achieved through Sufi practices and purification of the soul. That's the only way people or, or a Muslim can attain or can um, uh, experience happiness in their life. Purification of the soul through Sufi practices. Happiness in this sense is an inexpressible joy and pleasure which cannot be achieved through intellectual speculation. 
So you see the the the, the he is talking about the inferiority of human intellectual uh, as compared to you know knowledge that uh, that, that 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 people and uh, someone can gain through the practice of sufism uh, <clears throat> this is because this state can be obtained only by removal of the veil of sensual perception open the hijab yeah and uh, well in 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 sufi term they call it yeah. and uh, the way to attain is no doubt belong to the sufi tradition although he's not as claimed by some modern writers uh, well some some say that he was not a practicing sufi in the strict sense of the word but from his writing one would easily assume that the that he is in fact very familiar and perhaps possesses unusual knowledge of this particular science that is sufism it is also a matter of fact that ibn khaldun wrote a special book on sufism he wrote a book a special book on sufism and the book entitled shifa as-sail li tahdhib al masail if we have time then you can read uh, the the book or the translation of the book of course in our study here we are not interested in you know dwelling too much on the uh, the book shifa as-sail eh? because our concern here is merely to see the influence of sufism in ibn khaldun's thought particularly in the muqaddimah one of the earliest serious study of this aspect of ibn khaldun was perhaps uh, an article written by uh, a person by the name of mia syria uh, who published his uh, his uh, article in uh, 1987 in the journal of islamic culture the the article uh, um, uh, was uh, titled ibn khaldun and islamic mysticism in her article uh, syria was a lady in her article she made several assumptions with regard to ibn khaldun attitude towards uh, religion and religious knowledge theological and philosophical knowledge and more importantly towards the spiritual and mystical side of human beings and human culture one of the most interesting assumption or rather conclusion made by syria which is very relevant to our present study is that she said yeah uh, i i make uh, put a quotation here he or ibn khaldun believed that the true road towards improvement of man in his past of mystic that the mystical experience can reveal and make certain that no metaphysic proof and that when they try to prove it they when they try to to prove it they lead astray and this is not a strange conclusion for ibn khaldun to have drawn since the element of mysticism uh, in fact played a very significant role in ibn khaldun thought he employed the argument of mysticism in his critic of kalam or al mil kalam so we just need to look at his definition of tawhid and iman he was talking about tawhid and iman faith in which he used such as uh, the, the terminology eh? the, the, what i mean is terminology so, such as al hal hal means state and maqam eh? station to describe the true sense of faith 
And for Ibn Khaldun, so far as Islamic culture and civilization is concerned, the role and function of Sufism is enormous significant. He see and recognize Sufism as one of the most important manifestation of Islamic culture. It is not only a social phenomenon or an everyday attitude of life, uh, uh, everyday attitude to life as it was in the early days of Islam, but also a philosophical and intellectual force which later give rise to its own unique and exclusive literary traditions. I think uh, <laughs> I should stop at the moment if there is any, if there are any, if there are any you know, response or question from the participants eh? um, on uh, what I have uh, highlighted just now. Yeah? And inshallah, we'll continue again you know, in the next session. So I now hand over to uh, Brother Shahran, you open for questions. If there is any, any, you know, any question, please. Thank you very thank much. Allah Waliyu Taufik. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we go to the first one from Suzali. Prof, yeah. can you help simplify the meaning and differences of ontology and epistemology? and how to apply these jargons in understanding the nature of worldview of the Mukaddim. Any other question? That Okay. The next one, um, I think this uh, from Nadir also is wrong question. Let me take uh, Brother Nerudin first. Prof, can you explain further about the abuse of Ibn Khaldun work by the French Orientalists? to break the unity of the Berber and Arab societies in the territory of Algeria. Uh, uh, Nurin asked also about uh, Sufism. I think you answered it in detail. Uh, how is Ibn Khaldun's view of Sufism? As far as I know, Ibn Khaldun is often considered a strong Sufi critic, especially toward figure of Ibn Arabi. Mm -hmm. Ibn Khaldun view of Sufism as having negative effect of, on civilization. Mm. And Suzali has another question. Uh, your view, Prof, on Greek philosophy integrated into Islamic world through translation and knowledge transfer, thus we are flourished. But why today Islamic nation somehow regress compared to the West in terms of research, innovation, and technology? Okay, Prof. Okay. Uh, well, I tried, just try to understand, you know, the the, the uh, issues that raised by the, you know, the... The participants, inshallah. Well, ontology and epistemology is two branches of uh, philosophy, actually. Yeah? Ontology was this, is, is about the nature of being, and uh, uh, epistemology is something to do with knowledge, you know, the theory of knowledge. Yeah? So, uh, well, of course, uh, when we, I mean, uh, want to discuss about worldview, you know, we have to take into account the ontology and epistemology and axiology, in fact, you know, uh, to understand, uh, to have a, a kind of a holistic uh, view of uh, things. Uh, that's the first one. The, what's the second one? It's about, it's about Greek philosophy. Yeah? I think if I, if I can, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, conclude. Well, Greek philosophy actually is, uh, as as we 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 mentioned in in uh, in, in in the lecture just now, uh, some of the Muslim philosophers were very much influenced by Greek philosophy. They were trying to uh, at that time, you know, uh, if we can use this terminology, to to Islamize the philosophical doctrines eh, that is you know uh, that they they, they, they they took it from the from the Greek yeah? because there are a lot of uh, things a lot of hikmah that we can uh, well, but that is uh, in line with the teaching of Islam so but of course uh, 
to talk about theology, you know, theology is something very, very, very different because uh, theology is uh, is uh, is different domain. Yeah? But philosophy, as far as uh, we can uh, use it as a methodology of thinking, you know, to understand things, you know, to explain matters, and uh, it is okay. We can use, um, uh, you know, we can. Uh, use their methods and their, uh, uh, you know, approach yeah, in uh, understanding certain things. And of course, in in Islam, you know, uh, if I can give you some some examples, you know, uh, logics or ilm mantik in the Islam we call it ilm mantik. We use a lot of logics in our. In, in fact, in Islamic fiqh, we use a lot of logic. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, logical method. Uh, deduction, induction. You know? This is this is what we use, and it, it is it is not the, it's not the problem at all. You know, it's no, uh, we can make use uh, uh, you know the 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 the, the right method uh, or right. In fact, you know, in uh, usul fiqh, we use a lot of uh, you know these uh, uh, logical and rational arguments uh, uh, to come up with. Uh, you know, um, certain uh, uh, concrete idea on certain things. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I, I I forgot the question. Can can you repeat again? This from Brother Nuruddin about Nuruddin. Uh, yeah. Nuruddin. Okay. Yeah. I think my voice. Okay. Mm. About abuse of Ibn Khaldun work by French Orientalists to break the unity of the Berber and Arab societies in the territory of Algeria. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this is normal uh, use and abuse. You no, know? use is good, abuse is bad. You no, know? people well tend to abuse. Of course, uh, as I told you, you know, uh, we might read the same text, but we might come up with different, uh, you know, the perception, a different view. The things, and never mind. We are the one who create or who construct our own narrative. So this is very important. You know, we read Ibn Khaldun. We read Ibn Khaldun from our own perspective, and we make use of Ibn Khaldun based on what we understand, not what other people understand of uh, Ibn Khaldun. That is very very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to to, to have a, a, a clear a clear you know um, vision on that. Otherwise, uh, we will get confused you know? because some people, you know, to the extreme case, you know, there are some Western authors who you know who consider Ibn Khaldun as an atheist. It is impossible. I mean, in in our you know, uh, as far as we can understand what what he, he, he was writing, you know, it, it is impossible that he is an atheist. But there were some uh, you know authors who uh, tried to portray Ibn Khaldun as an atheist and uh, you know um, the one who is not uh, you know not. Um, Stick to the to the basic, you know, the doctrine of Islam and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, bro. Uh, yeah. Any other? Uh, yeah. Uh, there are. I think my my echo of my voice. Mm -hmm. uh, there are question from the Prof. Fata, brother Bashiru, brother uh, Ajaz, and Ida, and all. We, I will forward this question to you. Maybe okay. next session you can highlight which are relevant. Well, uh, inshallah, topic. inshallah, yeah, we'll have we'll have some time to understand the question first, and then uh, we try to, <laughs> try to give uh, respond accordingly. Yeah, if if, okay, it bro, uh, if it is not satisfied, uh, I'm sorry about that because as I told you, I can only catch some fish, not all the fish in 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 the ocean. Yeah, yeah. so please forgive me. Yeah. Thank two, you very three much. minutes conclusion, bro. Uh, yeah. Summary for today. Two, three minutes. Two, three minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Concluding okay. remarks. Actually, yeah. yes.
Cheers.